the year is 2012, the month is May and the date is the 4th, or the 11th of April if you live somewhere else in the world, doesn't matter, I won't discriminate. After falling into space at the end of last year's hit film Thor, Loki meets with an intergalactic being known as the Other, who promises him a throng of evil alien soldiers to take over the Earth in Loki's name all in exchange for the Tesseract, mysterious energy source. Now, if you haven't realized yet, The Avengers is a film that combines four of Marvel Comics' most successful film franchises into one big cinematic extravaganza, the franchises being Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, and the Hulk. The film does a pretty good job of explaining what is happening and why this Tesseract is so important and how it was both a plot device in Thor and Captain America, so if you haven't seen any of those respective movies, you should be treading in safe waters. However, if you have never seen Iron Man, Iron Man 2, Thor, Captain America, The Incredible Hulk, or even the lesser known and equally lesser grade Hulk from way back when, what do you do in watching The Avengers? Unless you've been living under a rock and neglected those movies for the past decade, it's as much mystery as the Tesseract and its proclaimed infinite power source as to why you're even watching this movie. The fact of the matter, however, is so blatantly simple that it boggles even the minds of relatively knowledgeable dolphins off the coast of Australia. The Avengers is a box office smash, not like anyone expected anything less, but the thing with people is that if there is something going on that doesn't relate in even the slightest bit to their personal interest or emotional intrigue but constitutes a high level of curiosity and social change on a wide scale, people will try to experience it. One could be optimistic and hope that everyone seeing this film has seen all of the respective films that went into the pre-story of the Avengers, but come on, let's be honest. The 50-year-old man sitting four seats down munching on popcorn and sipping on an icy that has been depleted for the past 25 minutes? He probably took kids who read Marvel Comics in high school, stuffed them in a locker, threw away the padlock, and brought in all of his comic book hating friends to laugh at the expense of the nerd who is actually interested in the comics in the first place. Or maybe he is that nerd stuffed in a locker. One can never be sure. So Loki comes back to Earth and brainwashes some of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s top men to fulfill his personal agenda. How selfish. By the way, sidebar, S.H.I.E.L.D. is not, in this case, a wooden or metal type of personal armor used to deflect arrows or angry comic book fanboys, but the International Security Council that brought together the Avengers Initiative. S.H.I.E.L.D. also has other ulterior motives revolving around the mass production of high-powered weaponry, which adds a nice sprinkling or frosting to a basic plot but really doesn't contribute anything more. We get to see their super powerful weapon prototype once, and when shot at the evil master mind Loki, it doesn't seem to make a scratch. That may be because Loki may or may not be a god and may or may not have godlike powers, but one need not dwell on such a point. Nick Fury, played by Samuel L. Jackson, assembles what is called a response team for about two acts of the movie, but is really known as the Avengers to everyone else who paid the 10, 12, or 15 bucks for a ticket to see it. Tony Stark's billionaire entrepreneurial personal life is displayed before he is called into action. Captain America mindlessly beats on punching bags in a very 40s-style gym. Bruce Banner is in some part of the world healing the sick while trying to avoid becoming the other guy, a phrase he frequently runs to the ground but which ultimately displays his inability to accept the other guy for what he really is, one of the strongest comic book characters ever, the Hulk. Thor flies in through way of lightning bolt just in time for the party. He missed the awkward silent moments when people are slowly filtering into the party, but arrived fashionably late to catch the action right when it starts, something I suspect most of us would like to do as well. It's not really explained in the movie how Thor made it to Earth other than a mentioning by Loki that his father Odin managed to conjure enough dark energy to transport him. That's right, let's skip the whole part about him severing the cosmic bridge from Asgard to Earth and throw Thor into the mix by way of a five second line of dialogue. Maybe it will be greater explained at Thor 2. And if Loki appears once more as the main villain, I will not only be disappointed but will be determined to call the Avengers Thor 1.5 with other superheroes. It's not that Loki is a bad villain, he's a great one. It's just that these comics have literally years and years of stories and arcs, not to mention multiple villains. Would it be that hard to showcase another? Maybe, maybe not. We also have Black Widow and Hawkeye, who are trained deadly assassins, one who can move her body in mesmerizing ways, and the other who is a modern day Robin Hood. Go figure. Together, the team has to prevent Loki from taking over the world as most superhero plot lines go. As expected by many, including myself, the first two acts of the movie really focus on the fact that the Avengers don't really work well together, and to be honest, it isn't hard to understand what the movie's trying to land on with such a display. You put a group of superheroes together who either think they're the best, hate their superhero form, seek revenge, or have no idea why they are living in an age when they should be dead, and you've got a mix of people who just really don't want to be there. Kind of like The Breakfast Club, if you think about it. John Hughes would be proud. So, as any cliche plot development goes, the Avengers will learn to work as a team and the final act of the movie follows their focused and coordinated team attack which ultimately, spoilers, ends in the beating of the bad guy. The movie is funny when it's funny and action packed when it's action packed. Some of the jokes aren't necessary but seem to function in the same way that a good joke by a professor functions in a crowded lecture hall. The movie was obviously made to please audiences and it shows. The only difference is that this is a solid movie and doesn't submit to the adverse failures of other major blockbusters such as the blood cringing Transformers. As a film, it's good in the same way that Twin 
Twinkies are good, or even a hot fudge sundae. You truly enjoy eating the delectable treats and will often go back for more, but once finished, you don't seem to dwell on them. The movie is a great see if you want to kick back and chill with some friends or even unleash the inner comic book persona within. But it shouldn't be viewed as the next hard-boiled and definitely isn't artistic in the sense that The Dark Knight was artistic. As the first comic book team movie, it's a spectacle. Every hero gets their time to shine and the appeal was wide, as box office sales seem to show. If you're tired of the discards of the pulp-up content that Hollywood manages to spew out, this film will be a good way to restore any hopes in the industry that you may have lost. And if you have no problem with the current state of the film industry, I suggest that you go to your nearest movie theater and buy tickets to the next showing of whatever poorly made romantic comedy that the industry has managed to throw up.